All right, here we go. We are live. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie B, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's much anticipated debate between uh, T Rock and T Jump Battle of the T's tonight. Two seasoned debaters duking it out with T Jump increasing his power levels already with that beautiful looking shrimp pasta dinner. Gentlemen, Thank you so much for being here and giving us your time for this epic showdown. What's going on, gents? Nothing. Potato. Nothing Good at evening, all. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Living the dream. Another day in paradise. Well, gentlemen, why don't we uh, kind of break the ice, get to know you guys a little bit before we get into the opening statements. Uh, T-Rock, let's start with you. T-Rock, how you been? A little bit about yourself. Go ahead. I've been good. Um, things slowed down for me a lot since the uh, summer heat wave, so I have a little more free time here and there. Um, still have lots to do, but um, yeah, my uh, my position is young earth creationist. Um, I'm here to defend the literal uh, history of Genesis and demonstrate to the audience um, that the the uh, biblical position is logical, sound. It's the most um, rational position to hold. And um, it's demonstrated by a high level of consistency in, in science and engineering and um, and history and pretty much any, any venue you want to go into. So thank you to the audience for uh, tuning in. Um, appreciate the support. Thank you, Donnie, for hosting us. Um, always did a really good job on production. And thank you, T Jump, for joining the uh, conversation. You rock. I appreciate the introduction. I do have the relevant links posted in the description box for people to see more from T, T Rock. Uh, so some of your past debates listed there, as well as T Jump. Uh, T Jump, thanks for being here. Uh, a little bit about yourself. A little bit about your channel. Uh, still selling bathtubs. I, I grow potatoes in the bathtubs now. It's uh, much more profitable that way. <laughs> That's impressive. Hope, hope you're selling lots of uh, potato growing bathtubs. That's impressive. Um, okay, well, let's go over the format for tonight's debate. Specifically, uh, we are debating creation versus evolution. So the good old classic creation evolution debate uh, format, 12 minute opening statements, followed by eight minute uninterrupted rebuttals. And then we're gonna have a free flowing discussion where the debaters T-Rock, T-Jump will be uh, discussing points related to the topic. Then a five minute concluding statement. And then as always, this is where we get uh, you guys in the audience involved. We're gonna have roughly a 25 minute audience Q&A. Just make sure you're tagging me with your questions at Standing for Truth and that way I won't miss them. All right, well, with that out of the way, we're gonna hand it over to T-Rock. T-Rock, whenever you're ready, you've got 12 minutes for an opening statement and uh, let me get the timer ready. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Donnie. I'm uh, sharing screen. Looks good, T-Rock. Okay. I'll put this on full screen real quick. Okay. <clears throat> As always, my, my intro, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If evolutionists use good arguments, they would be creationists. <clears throat> Again, not a knock on evolutionists. It's just not a, a very good position to hold. Okay, um, I don't have near as many slides as normal. Hopefully, I'll be able to get through these. Um, what I want to do is start at a high level, and then if we need to uh, dig deep, that's fine, too. Um, so... <clears throat> With that, um, I want to point out the the important differences between creation and evolution. Um, what you see highlighted in red is what I will say is kind of mutually exclusive to that particular paradigm. So um, creation is purposeful. It's intentional. Um, rapid processes, uh, max six to 10,000 years, separate ancestry, basic body plans don't change. Evolution, <clears throat> quite the opposite in almost every respect. There is no direction. Um, everything's random. There are very slow processes. Um, 
and 4.5 billion and 13.8 billion years respectively for the earth and the universe and then of course they <clears throat> consign to universal common ancestry <clears throat> drastic body plan changes over time so um, those things in red basically set each one apart from the other and so it it, it also indicates how um, any given individual is going to approach um, you know evidence and and uh, so forth interpretation of evidence <clears throat> okay some key uh, points to ponder deep time can never be demonstrated you can calculate it you can show numbers you can make estimations you can make all kinds of um, suggestions about it but you can never actually demonstrate deep time <clears throat> radical body plan changes over successive generations can never be demonstrated you can see small changes such as um, oh there's a number of them probably but uh, the bacteria comes to mind with the flagellum uh, in Linsky's experiment you can see some things where they uh, <clears throat> make some basic changes but the fundamental body plan itself does not change um, and it can't be just demonstrated kind of ironically if it could and if somebody says, yes, we can, if it could, what it really demonstrates is that you don't need deep time to get radical body plan changes. <clears throat> Fundamentally, there is no technology that can ever be developed based on the exclusive characteristics of the evolutionary or deep time paradigm. So we can go back up one and just try to imagine what kind of technology are you going to develop that needs 4.5 billion years or even 10,000 years. Um, the answer is none. It's completely useless to um, today's living population. Universal common ancestry, you can't develop any technology whatsoever that demonstrates that. And even if you could, it basically uh, is a demonstration of both intelligent design and processes. <clears throat> Drastic body plan changes over time. You can't demonstrate that in any meaningful way without, again, basically just showing that intelligent design is required and deep time is not required <clears throat> so <clears throat> we'll talk about converging lines of evidence and the differences between the two positions creation <clears throat> timeline is based on independent methods that aren't calibrated against each other that's very important um, <clears throat> and that word independent is kind of the key here cold subducted slabs um, referring to subduction zones uh, into the into the mantle Earth's magnetic field decline, ocean salinity, lunar recession, pop population metrics, dinosaur soft tissue, presence of carbon-14. Each one of these can be basically treated completely independent of the other, and they all converge on limits to how much time could have passed since the uh, beginning of the so-called evolutionary process. Compare that to the evolution timeline. It's based on dependent methods that are that are calibrated against each other. So carbon-14, um, and, and I've tried to list these roughly in the order of the way they're, they're typically used, um, it, uh, basically going from most recent uh, history to most distant history in the past. But carbon-14 for very, very uh, recent history, it's fairly well understood that carbon-14 is decently reliable up to, I don't know, four or 5,000 years or so. And when you get beyond that, uh, you start having to reach out to other methods. Um, obviously, when you get up to the 50, 60,000 year range, carbon-14 completely falls off the radar and you have to start with something else um, entirely. Oxygen isotopes, kind of the same thing. It's got this prescribed range that it's good for. Um, what it's not good for is uh, very, very short term, oops, sorry, very, very short term uh, dating, and it's not good for very long term dating either, as in uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. As far as I know, it's it's really restricted to tens of thousands of years. VARVs kind of in the same class as oxygen isotopes, ice cores, sort of the same. You could argue that somebody is using them, you know, beyond several tens of thousands of years. Um, but it's still the same basic idea. Radiometric dating, non-biological, <laughs> not counting carbon-14 here. Um, so you, you've got a variety of methods, potassium, argon, um, lead, lead, rubidium, strontium, whatever. Each one of them slots into a specific range that they're used for. Um, but they also all have failure points and all have to be compared to something else to understand 
the quote unquote validity of them, of any given result that you get from lab test. And then of course there's geology, <clears throat> which um, as far as I know, geology actually goes goes into dating beyond what any uh, current radiometric methods do. I'm willing to be proven wrong on that. I'm not positive about that, but I'm pretty sure that is the case is that geology is kind of the, the, um, the reference point for extremely deep time, even where the earth is concerned. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Creation versus evolution design in nature. The big question everybody has to ask when you're comparing these two paradigms is um, why homologies if it's designed, why would they be similar in any, any way? I think this, this graphic here kind of says it all. Look to the left here and you see uh, homologous, homologous structures uh, across a wide variety of, of uh, uh, animal life, including uh, people. So you've got penguins, alligators, bats, humans, human again, cat, whale, bat. Um, but <clears throat> the reason is right here, it's, it's migration. There are design principles that work and there are design ideas that don't work. Um, so in, in human, modern human history, we've developed automobiles with wheels. We've developed, um, you know, trains, even airplanes have wheels, uh, just about any vehicle that travels outside pretty much has wheels. There are obviously a few exceptions. Um, things that go on the water, for example, and then there are things like hovercrafts and whatnot, but uh, the wheel is the most versatile, allowing you to go the most places, but it is far, far, far inferior to the um, multi-digit extremities that are found in mammals in particular. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of restrict it to, to mammals, or, or I'll say not necessarily mammals, but land animals, um, because <clears throat> with this basic design of having, a, sorry, having spreadable fingers, having a uh, flexible wrist, having a, an elbow joint, um, so on and so forth, all the way up to the shoulder to get this much flexibility um, out of any one of these um, animals or people gives you the ability to go into the mountaintops, go into the slopes, go amongst the trees, even climb the trees for most of them, not necessarily all of them, um, walk across rocks, sand, ice, you can see what I've listed here, mountains, valleys, caves, rivers, rocks, sand, trees, mud, lakes, oceans, gravel, inclines, cliffs, you name it. This design works so that land animals can migrate the, the entire planet um, where, where they're suitable to go. There will be restrictions for any one um, animal type, of course, so you don't necessarily expect um, you know, uh, like a, a white-tailed deer to go up into the deep snow of Alaska or something like that. But um, every, everything has its limitations on what it can do and can't do. But the, the, the greater point here is that you must have this type of structure. If you, if you tried to have such a thing as a biological entity that had something like a wheel on it, it would not be able to go hardly any of these places. It would be extremely limited. So if a... Um, if an evolutionist can come up with an idea for how to derive locomotion um, that is so versatile um, without design, I'd love to hear about it. <clears throat> and why DNA similarities if designed? Well, it's because we all share a common food source. The idea here is that every one of these creatures you see here, people, deer, raccoon, even fish can eat this stuff. Um, plant life is basically the common food source. Um, so, of course, in the creation um, paradigm, uh, plants were created first because they are the food supply. And plants reproduce exponentially faster than any animals do. Um, <clears throat> and so what do these uh, plants provide every one of us, regardless of what life form you are as far as a land animal? They do the same thing for all of our hair, our nails, our skin, our teeth, our blood, our nerves, our muscle, our cartilage, all of our major tissues get the same basic benefit out of this. So when you put when you put the need for the chemical, um, I'll call it chemical enhancement of biological organisms together with their uh, need to migrate, um, you get obvious sign of, of uh, very high level integration in, in design. Um, so 
I think I'm going to uh, close with that. I've probably got a few more minutes left, but that will be the uh, the gist of my approach. And like I said, if uh, if T Jump wants to go deeper into some specific subject, I'll be happy to do that too. So I yield my time. <clears throat> all right, thank you very much, uh, T Rock. That was pretty much 12 minutes, so all worked out nicely. T Jump. Now we're going to hand it over to you whenever you're ready. You have up to 12 minutes. Floor is yours. <laughs> cool. Uh you play the video again it's in the chat no you can play it from your end i'm doing things on my end <sighs> play it from my end hmm hmm let's see uh i don't even see you guys anymore oh yeah you made me full screen gotcha how do i share screen there is come on t jump do we really got to sit through the same video i'm not allowing you yep. to play a video you're gonna have to do your own your own nope. um or, nope. or, or I'll, I'll i'll shut this debate down because i'm putting my foot listen we're not coming into debates for you to just play the same video that you played last time that's so it's up it's, to you. that's the evidence so <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm you want you can, no no if you want you can just skip your opening you want to skip your opening no nope, right i want to play the video because that's no, you're, you're not playing the video you're not playing the yeah, video. I am. i'm playing the video no, no you're not playing the video yep playing the video no, no. yep i'm yep, putting my foot down video. yep playing the video it's, it's you, gotta happen. you could put the video you in the forfeit you, i mean if you want to forfeit the bait that's fine but if you're like just not gonna let the opponent play the evidence like well i i think it's a silly way to debate but if you want to t rock it, it's up to you it's your debate if you want t jump to have another lazy opening statement because uh t jump probably can't understand you know 90 percent of the words jackson wheat's putting forth in in his video so it's up to you uh, t rock you want uh t <laughs> T jump to play a video for his opening. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm not typically, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm super easy to going on just about everything. I think, you know, that Donnie, um, but I really don't like the video openings. The whole idea is that um, somebody is going to, I can leave. I don't pressure. care. Like if you guys, if you guys don't want to look at the evidence, cause you're, you're biased, that's up to you, but Hey, no, I mean, share the evidence, but I want you to share, share the evidence T jump. Yeah. I mean, why are you so lazy? That's what the video does. So play the video. I mean, so what lines of evidence does the video play? Uh, you'll Chromosome see you two play fusion, the video. Play, play the video. Tectolic, Archaeopteryx, Therapsis. So if, you're, if you're not going to take my evidence, I'm just going to leave because this is just a waste of my time if you're not going to take the evidence I'm providing. Well, that's fine. That's fine. I, I, I'm a busy man. I got a lot to do. So Okay, so if, so if you leave, that's if you're fine. Done, just, if you're done, then good. Play the video or I'm out. It's up, it's up to T. It's up to T Rock. Play the video or I'm out. Just just tell me it's what up to, It's up to T Rock. I got stuff to do. I'll tell you what. Let's uh, let's compromise. Uh, T jump. Um, do three minutes of your video, and then you do your own presentation of nope. whatever evidence. You I'm not compromising. Get. You, I let you have twelve minutes of all your nonsense. So I get that. I get twelve minutes of actual science from an actual scientist. Oh, Jackson Wheat's an actual scientist. Yes. Okay. So what's his PhD in? You don't need a PhD to be a scientist. There's lots of scientists that don't have PhDs. Okay, so I'm I'm a scientist. He has a, he has a degree. T Rock's a scientist. Uh, no, you guys are not scientists. You guys are creationists. <laughs> I'm you not impressed video, with any play the video or not. So, so just, any scientist who believes that they're related to a pine tree is not impressive to me. So, okay, so I'll, I'll play the video, but I but I will say that everybody in the chat is anti the video. <laughs> Well, you're, you're in the minority here, but we'll play the video, but it's just not looking good for you. Can I, can I ask real quick, is this the same video? That's especially if you want to be taken videos. seriously. Exact but I will say this, video. I will say this, I will say this, you're playing the video on your end. You're not coming in here and making me as host play the video, t -Jump. Okay, I don't know, I, I don't know what kind of show you think I'm running here, but listen, you ain't, <laughs> you ain't a tough guy. You ain't intimidating by any means, okay? So if you want to play a video, play it from your end and I'll share your screen. Go ahead. Sure. Sure. Sound good? Sure. Uh, Go right? ahead. That's right. On this channel about how evolution is used to understand the past. But today we're going to talk about how evolution can be used to predict the future. So let's jump right in. <laughs>
As we've mentioned on this channel before, the hallmark of a good theory is its ability to make predictions. Anyone can make up an ad hoc rationalization to explain away data that contradicts a particular model, but not every model can be used to make accurate predictions about future data. If the evolution of all organisms from a set of common ancestors is true, then we should be able to test that. As it happens, we can. We can test it in numerous ways, with morphology, ecology, biogeography, genetics, and with fossils. So, let's take some examples. Darwin himself provided numerous predictions. One of the most famous was the prediction of a pollinating insect that possessed a proboscis with an absurd length that could reach down inside the flower of a peculiar species of orchid from Madagascar that held its nectar deep inside a long tube. This insect was eventually found, a moth called Xanthopan. Darwin also observed that the bones inside the wings of birds looked like they were fingers that got fused together. So he predicted that a fossil of an ancient bird with separate fingers would be found one day. This ended up being Archaeopteryx. The first specimen was discovered just two years after the publication of Darwin's book on the origin of species. But the evolutionary predictions didn't end there. An example of a modern prediction of evolution is one we have discussed at length the chromosome 2 fusion, including all its details, such as the telomeric repeats at the fusion site, two centromeres, one of which is deactivated, as well as the conserved centony between chromosome 2 and the two that remain separate in the other great apes, which can only be predicted based on common descent. Not only was the fusion predicted, but creationists have been completely unable to refute it, but since we already made a video about that, we're going to leave it there. The prevalence of mutations in organisms even allows researchers to make predictions about their prevalence in populations. For example, there are different types of mutations, such as mutations from guanine to thymine or from cytosine to adenine, etc. These mutations occur at different rates in the human population, so are found at different frequencies. Using these frequencies, we can generate a graph like this, showing the signature of mutations. If mutations were also the cause of interspecies genetic differences, then we would predict a similar spectrum graph when counting up the different types of nucleotide differences between humans and chimps. And we do. In fact, the spectrum also matches when you look at the differences between humans and more distantly related apes like gorillas and orangutans, and matches when comparing differences between those other apes such as chimps and gorillas. This makes no sense under a non-evolutionary model. Under creationism, it implies that a creator created interspecies DNA differences that just so happened to look exactly as though they had occurred by the same natural processes that give rise to within-species differences. It also makes no sense under a non-evolutionary model why genetic sequences for homologous proteins converge the further you go back in time, which was, by the way, also predicted under evolution. When we reconstruct ancestral sequences from different groups of species, we find that those ancestral sequences are more similar to one another than the descendant species, implying a branching pattern of divergence that fits the evolutionary model of common descent perfectly. Researchers also sometimes make predictions about specific genetic homologies in organisms. Michael Coates wrote the 2003 The Evolution of Paired Fins, when he specifically notes the homologies between scapulocoracoid or pectoral fin cartilage and certain branchial or gill arch cartilage. His abstract ends with this, quote, No transformation of arch to girdle is necessarily implied, but some signal of developmental relatedness is predicted, close quote. And, sure enough, the 2009 paper, Shared Developmental Mechanisms, Pattern the Vertebrate Gill Arch and Paired Fin Skeletons by Gillis, Don, and Shubin, found, quote, the molecular patterning of chondrichthyan branchial rays, gill rays, and reveal profound developmental similarities between gill rays and vertebrate appendages. Close quote. Another example of a very precise prediction concerns our yolk, or rather lack thereof. As all amniotes, our embryonic development is typified by the formation of several membranes, among them the amnion, hence the name. These membranes retain the moisture for the embryo, which allowed amniotes to invade dry land. Most amniotes lay eggs that contains a massive yolk sac filled with nutrients, which allowed for the development to be more complete before birth, without the need for a post-birth metamorphosis stage as is the case with amphibians. Egg laying is the ancestral reproductive state of amniotes, and there are still a few mammals around that do this, like the monotremes. However, eutherian mammals like us have a placenta that made the yolk sac obsolete, 
but curiously, we still have a vestigial yolk sac that doesn't have any yolk in it. All of this points to the conclusion that our ancestors once laid eggs containing a yolk sac filled with yolk. And yolk is mostly protein coated by genes. So if eutherians are descended from amniotes that once laid eggs with yolk, we should expect to see leftovers of these genes in our genome, and we do. They are broken, but they are still there, and when compared to their functional homologs and other amniotes, they also have the same neighboring genes. This is called shared centony, which is also a predicted phenomenon as a direct consequence of common descent. Aside from genetic predictions, evolution also makes fossil predictions. First, Robert Broom predicted the existence of an amniote with a double hinged jaw joint based on the idea that mammals evolved from the colloquially called reptiles. The jaw joint of ancestral amniotes is formed by the articulation between the articular and quadrate bones, while that of mammals is between the dentary and squamosal. Broom deduced that the only plausible way for this transition to have happened is that, at one point, both jaw joints were together at the same time. And this was discovered decades later in Probane Ignathus and a whole host of other near mammal fossils. William Beebe predicted that birds should have gone through a stage in their evolution where they had asymmetrical flight feathers on their front and back legs. He predicted this by the fact that Archaeopteryx had sparse flight feathers on its hind legs, which weren't enough to be useful for flight, so he thought they were vestigial, indicating that an ancestral stage with bigger feathers on the hind legs existed. This was found in the form of Microraptor. Also in relation to birds, a feather morphotype was predicted by embryological data and later found in dinosaurs, such as Bipiosaurus. Paleontologists predicted an ant fossil that had features of wasps in the Cretaceous, and that was confirmed as Sphecomirma. Neil Shubin and colleagues predicted a fish-like tetrapod or tetrapod-like fish, and at that stage would there be much difference, in Devonian strata of Canada, and that was confirmed as Tiktaalik. Researchers long predicted the existence of sauropods in the Triassic, and that was confirmed as Isanosaurus from Thailand. Recently, a semi-aquatic whale ancestor was found named Paragocetus. This cetacean has a flattened tail like a beaver, which was useful for propelling it through the water. It also showed how the earliest marine whales migrated from their place of origin near India to the Americas. Later whales, such as Basilosaurus, had tail flukes, while earlier whales, such as Pachycetus, had thinner tails that would not have been especially useful for swimming. Paragocetus fits in directly between these with the tail shape predicted by researchers. The list goes on, but the point is that there's no reason for these predictions to have been fulfilled if different clades of organisms were created separately from each other, as imagined both in the flood geology and intelligent design models. Then there's biogeography. Geologists have worked out that the crust of the Earth has changed much throughout its history and organisms have had to adapt to it. Regarding this, researchers correctly predicted that fossil marsupials would be found specifically in Eocene strata in Antarctica since they moved from South America to Australia at a time when these land masses were connected by Antarctica. The same is true for many dinosaurs and plants predicted for even earlier times based on what was alive in the then adjacent land masses of the Mesozoic. So what does all of this mean? It means that evolution works. It makes accurate, specific predictions about what should be found both in the fossil record and our own genomes. To quote young earth creationist Todd Wood, quote, Evolution is not a theory in crisis. It is not teetering on the verge of collapse. It has not failed as a scientific explanation. There is evidence for evolution, gobs and gobs of it, close quote. Or, to quote young earth creationist Kurt Wise, quote, Evolutionary theory suggests that land plants evolved from marine green algae and that land animals evolved from marine fish. The first appearances of fish, amphibians, and reptiles, as well as the position of morphological intermediates between fish and amphibians, are in exactly the order predicted by evolution. Close quote. Thus, if evolution were supplanted by some new theory, that theory would necessarily have to take into account all of the successful predictions made by evolution. You cannot make a new theory by ignoring valid data from the old one. That old data must be built upon. So, Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs> Anything of your own words, sir? Or, yeah, I mean that, that one video debunks all of creationism. It's just here's here's evidence from evolution making novel predictions and 
therefore you lose. It's that simple. One model makes novel predictions that are successful and the other one doesn't. Game over, bro. Game over. All right. Well, very entertaining and an original opening statement. I do appreciate it. Uh, T jump. I do appreciate all, all the work, uh, effort, time, and energy put into that opening statement. So it's why hey. we pay you the big bucks. Why we pay you the big bucks. Okay. That's so now true. we're moving true. into uh, eight minute uninterrupted rebuttals. Uh, T Rock, we'll start with uh, your eight minute rebuttal. And then I'll make sure to, I see Jackson Wheat backstage, so I'll make sure to bring him in for his eight-minute rebuttal. So, T-Rock, whenever you're ready, floor is Give yours. Give me Go one ahead. second. I've got to do something real quick. It won't take but a second. Nope. No worries. Okay. Um, as T-Rock is doing that, I will remind everybody this is another debate marathon week. So, tomorrow we will be back here at nine o'clock, Charles Jennings and Merritt, who goes by Crimson Air on YouTube, they'll be debating soteriology, free grace versus conditional security, Second Peter 2.20. What is the proper exegesis of Second Peter 2.20? Then the very next day, we'll have a debate between CJ Cox and David Preston. They'll be debating our modern English translations, dangerous and trustworthy. So stay tuned. Lots more uh, exciting debates coming your way. T Rock is back. So, T Rock, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Donnie. Um, I think this that entire video can basically be debunked in, in just a few words, so to speak. Um, so, I'm probably not going to use anywhere near eight minutes here. But um, essentially, I kind of pointed this out earlier in my presentation. Um, in order for you to consider any one prediction, and I'm, I'm speaking whether we're talking evolution or um, creation, it does not matter, um, for you to, to make predictions that are relevant to this conversation, you need to use the principles that are exclusive to your paradigm. So, <clears throat> and that is exactly what that video did not do. It used a whole bunch of principles that actually cross the lines between both paradigms. And so let me, uh, let me share my screen real quick. So I can give, um, yeah, there we go. <clears throat> uh, so I, I basically just scratched down some notes that were brought up there and, and I'm probably not going to have to go past the first, um, the first three to make this point, but uh, the very first one that he talked about predictions was the moth and the flower with the with the longer probisc that could reach down to the bottom of the flower. That is absolutely a prediction that can easily be made by creation. Um, that's kind of what the whole point in this and this was, is that um, there is adaptability that's not mutually exclusive to evolution. There are changes in, in, um, in basic form, uh, but not body plan, so to speak. Um, so you don't need evolution to make a prediction about a moth and a flower. It's uh, basically just a regulatory gene probably that extended the length of the, the probisc. Um, and you don't need deep time either. Um, birds and fused fingers, same thing. That is really highlighted here. Um, again, whenever you're de designing locomotion for uh, living uh, organisms, you need something that can basically inhabit every environment. Um, so obviously fish don't swim on land and uh, people don't go into the depths of the ocean. Uh, nevertheless, what fish do you have enables them to navigate a wide variety of um, water settings and what people and raccoons and deer and all the other land animals have let them uh, traverse a wide variety of um, of land settings so anyway the point is there is a there is a very smooth gradient across all of the different terrains that animal life has to um, has to inhabit so it is easily predictable that you can find some living organism that can uh, traverse just about any uh, thing on the earth um, so again no deep time needed and um, and the principles that make that prediction are equally available to the creationists so basically that entire video was just a um, I, I don't know exactly which logical fallacy best applies but it was basically 
something like a genetic fallacy where they're assuming that their predictions are unique to evolution when they're not. Um, almost every single thing that was mentioned can be uh, derived from uh, young Earth position, no deep time, and built-in uh, design uh, variability. So I'm going to yield my time with that. All right, short and sweet, uh, T Rock. Let me check the. Okay, between three and four minutes. So anything not used, we can throw into the uh, open discussion. So uh, T Jump, we're going to hand it over to you for your rebuttal. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Uh, yeah, I don't think he understands how science or evidence works. Nobody thinks that predictions are mutually exclusive, that only one thing can make a prediction. Literally, in science, there's called a problem of underdetermination, which means infinitely many hypotheses can explain all predictions. That's not, it doesn't need to be exclusive to one hypothesis uh, to be evidence. It's just not how it works. Uh, the fact that creationism didn't make any of these predictions is why it's not evidence of creationism. The fact that you can say, I can post hoc make them is like a kid watching a basketball star do like a dunk from the three-point line and saying i can do that like no you can't kid you think you can if you can go do it stop telling us you can start making novel testable predictions but creationists don't do that it doesn't happen uh the only people doing that is the real scientists the scientists are doing these which is why there are dozens of examples like jackson Reek provided creationists don't provide any they just say oh i can ad hoc do that too but they can't because the model doesn't make predictions. All right. It's Another not short. Genetic, I don't, I don't know why I thought it was a genetic fallacy. A genetic fallacy is a fallacy of origins. Um, I, I don't, I don't know why he said genetic fallacy. There's not, not a genetic fallacy. There's nothing. The origin makes no difference to that argument. I don't, not a genetic fallacy. All right. Uh, T rock T jump with, with all the, the fun, aspects of this i'm sure uh debate to remember out of the way we're going to get into some discussion so here we go floor is now opened uh t jump just ended with his rebuttal so t rock why don't we let you pick the first topic ask the first question however you want to proceed floor is yours gentlemen go ahead okay i think we could go a number of directions here we just got done talking about predictions um yes i i do perfectly understand both the scientific method and what the logical Im implications of uh, trying to make predictions in, in a certain manner are um, the idea that there are infinitely many hypotheses basically just sounds like you've got an unfalsifiable paradigm. Um, oh, but okay. having said that, I have a quick question for you. Um, can you give a prediction of the evolutionary paradigm that specifically uses the ideas that I mentioned in my early in my PowerPoint of, of um, things that are exclusive to evolution that do not pertain to the creation position at all. So clearly you don't understand the scientific method. So the problem of undetermination isn't about a theory. It's, it's It means that there are infinitely many theories that can all explain any data always, no matter what. It's logically impossible to give like a, a piece of data that couldn't be explained by a different hypothesis. No matter what you give, any data you always see will always be able to be explained by a different hypothesis. So if you're asking me, can I present a piece of data that can only be explained by one hypothesis? No, that's literally a logical contradiction. You can't do that. It's a square circle. So the uh, problem of undetermination states any data can be explained by infinitely many hypotheses, creationism, uh, old earth, creationism, the Big Bang hypothesis, they can all explain the all, all of the data. Like, for example, uh, an alien kidnapped us all, put our brain in a vat, and the world was created five minutes ago, or a thousand years ago, or 10,000, or a billion. You can explain all the data with that. So the fact that the data can be explained by multiple hypotheses literally doesn't matter. Nobody cares. It has nothing to do with the scientific method. It's completely irrelevant. Okay, so you're saying the young Earth creation position is as valid as any other position out there. No, I'm saying you said position. infinitely many number of hypotheses. Right. right. So, so infinitely many the YEC position. No, no, including the YEC position. Any hypothesis can post hoc explain the data. They can all do that. Anybody can do that. That's not evidence of anything. Well, the evidence has been able like to predict it before we know. I'm going to say that just sounds like philosophical wandering because you can basically, like you just did earlier, make up a story and say, oh, see, I've got a good explanation. 
yes, that's what <clears throat> young earth creationism is. But but so so I agree with you. Just being able to make up a story post hoc isn't evidence. Anybody can do that. Everybody okay. can do that. Okay, I'm gonna completely disagree with all that, but let's try some of that what, out a little bit. What, <clears throat> what do you mean I, you disagree I'm, with that? What, like that's literally with, the scientific method 101. I'm How disagreeing you, with the application of it, so we're gonna try some application. A, application of, I don't understand what you're saying. Of the philosophy that you just espoused. That anybody can post hoc explain anything, and it's not evidence. No, we're gonna actually try some explanations. Well, I, I'm trying to understand what you're objecting to here. So, so I said, anybody can take any data and post hoc explain it into hypothesis, and you're disagreeing. So that with means. That? So again, it's it's philosophical wondering because you could say the exact same thing about the Big Bang, about evolution. Um, yes, I literally am so it, saying it can any basically hypothesis, fall into the every, same trap. Every hypothesis, just every some one of them, made up hypothesis. Right, right, right. So, so anyone can look at data and make it fit their hypothesis. Everybody, okay. Big Bang, Young Earth creationism, magical leprechaun, part of the universe, everybody. That's why so post hoc evidence <laughs> isn't evidence. So let's try that. Try what? what? Oh, oh I, I guess so. I'm still trying to follow what you're disagreeing with here. I don't understand what you're disagreeing with. Well, I, I think it'll best be explained by some examples here. So you, you made the claim earlier that... Um, Cre uh, creationism does not make the types of predictions that were in the video that you played, right? Uh, well, it didn't. It did not make those predictions. Evolution made those predictions. Okay, but you you specifically said that evolution or that that the creation position does not make predictions, uh, useful predictions like that. Right. Okay. You sure about that? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> I kind of doubt it, but <clears throat> so. Are you familiar with uh, who Russell Humphreys is? Yes, he's a creationist. So are you familiar with his um, prediction about the uh, magnetic field in Saturn? Uh, in Saturn? No. Uh, exactly. That's kind of my point. Specifically, okay. what happened Specifically, what happened was Russell Humphreys is a physicist, of course, and uh, he had worked for, I, I don't remember who it was, Goddard Space Center, one of those um, high-level outfits, and so he made a prediction based specifically on text from Genesis plus the 6,000 year timeline that's uh, assigned most frequently to the younger position. And so long story short is he crunched some very standard physics formulas. He said, okay, Saturn is 6,000 years old. It has X, Y, Z mass. This is what the magnetic field strength should be. Okay, so simultaneously, the um, the secular scientists that he worked with made their own predictions. I'm saying simultaneously. They may have had them in place before uh, Humphreys put his work together. But anyway, the point is there was an accepted um, calculation for that magnetic strength of Saturn um, before an actual space shuttle took a trip out into deep space, did a flyby, they were able to measure the magnetic field strength and um, Humphreys was accurate within about uh, uh, roughly three times what the, the actual reading was. Um, but the secular scientists were off by several orders of magnitude as in like three or four or five orders of magnitude that were completely off. Um, so yeah, very accurate prediction. Um, and, and so what you see here is the two different paradigms competing with the same sets of formulas get completely different results. One makes an accurate prediction, the other one flops considerably. And each one of those, they're using numbers exclusive to their paradigm, which was my point from the beginning about why that video really is not a deep. Okay, what was the prediction? Hmm? What was the prediction? I just told you. The, the, the actual field strength of Saturn. What is it? That's what he predicted. He calculated it, said it should fall in this range. The secular scientists made their own calculations and they said, no, it should fall in this range. They did a flyby. Okay, so I'm asking you to explain. So for example, uh, predicting in evolution, one of the things was the double hinted jaw joint. They said, if evolution is true, then we would see that uh, the double hinge was evolved from the single hinge and we'd see a progression of fossils that had one with the double hinge to the one with the single hinge and 
if it happened over millions of years, we see them in separate locations across uh, geological scales, and we found them exactly in that location. So explain to me how you get from creationism to magnetic field of Saturn has this much power. Okay, so you kind of said it for me. You said that this prediction about the double hinge uh, jaw joint happened over how many years? Millions. Exactly. That's the point. So I'm going back to the... How does Robert Humphreys make a prediction that if the universe was young Earth creationed, that Saturn's magnetic field will have a power of X? Okay. Again, like I said, the thing that separates YC from evolution is deep time. So I'm we're independently checking a time scale as an independent test to see if that much time has passed. If a test can be performed that demonstrates that that much time has not passed, it makes the entire idea of anything evolving over millions of years completely bogus. Okay. So the question, the question is, is why would Saturn have this magnetic field of this strength if the universe was 6,000 years old? How do you get from the conclusion it's 6,000 years old, therefore it has this strength? That's that's what I'm asking for. So how do you make that calculation? Sure, I guess. Like, How, how do you get to the conclusion that because of the age of the universe, the magnetic strength is going to be X? Well, again this is what I was pointing out earlier, things that are very unique to the YEC paradigm. And I did not list it here, but one of the things very unique to the YEC paradigm is the biblical text. And so what Russell Humphreys did was he read the text and it says, it says uh, that the earth was formed in water and out of water. So specifically what he did was he set up a, a mathematical model where he said that you have X amount of mass that is actually surrounded by water. What he did was he showed through standard physics that when uh, when you have all of the hydrogen bonds aligned and then you suddenly flip them, you induce a certain amount of magnetic field strength by doing so. And so it's mass dependent plus water dependent. It's, it's not one or the other. It's both together. And so he took that plus the limitation on time and said, OK, if saturn was formed in this way using water and it has the known mass and you start out with all of the hydrogen bonds aligned in a certain direction and you suddenly flip them or scramble them you should get xyz field strength at the point of creation and then after six thousand years passes you have an exponential decay curve of uh, magnetic degeneration and since only six thousand years has past he used that specifically as the stop point and said okay by that starting point at creation using water with xyz field strength six thousand years the, the decay curve of magnetic fields is well understood we can measure other planetary bodies the earth whatever so anyway he makes this prediction and when they do the flyby he is very very accurate whereas the evolutionary paradigm that did not start with water and does not use 6,000 years as a limitation, he comes up with a almost identical to what the actual field strength is. So that's relevant so that because when question. you try to apply deep time, where do you get it from? That's, that's the big question for everyone. Where do you get the deep time from? So again, you're, you're not answering the question. The question is, is how did he get to the conclusion that the number, whatever it is, of the magnetic strength of Saturn would be exactly that from the Bible. You're saying he does some magic with some numbers and poof, he gets it. it doesn't help me at all. So I need to be able to... I, tell, I, I, I told need... you pretty specifically for a layman. No, I told you pretty specifically. You didn't tell me anything. You said the he read Bibles, the Bible and he said, Bible. based on mass and that was formed in water, that it mm -hmm. has some magnetic strength. Where does it say that's not, what the that's mass not what I said. Saturn in? I said the world was formed in water and out of water. So what in is this evolutionary... In the evolutionary paradigm, the Earth was not formed in water and out of water. What does this have to do with Saturn? Because that you have to have the water to know how to calculate the field strength starting point. Of Saturn. How, how do we get world formed in water to Saturn 
Like, because does, the in- does, does this does this calculation apply to every planet? Does every planet have? Yes, the actually, it does. And and so that's one of the other points is he he used this exact same method and used it on on Neptune, Mars, the Earth, and uh, a couple other places, and basically used the same formula and said, okay, if you start with water with any one of these planetary bodies and you what allow six thousand years with the given mass. This is what the field strength should be. What, what, and he, what he was what, accurate multiple what do you, times. What does it mean you start with water and then poof planet? I don't understand. Start with water, poof planet, then gravitation, then electromagnetic field of strength X. I'm not getting the connection here. Okay. Well, again, it's about the hydrogen alignment. You, you have to start with X amount of mass of water and you have to start with hydrogen alignment. What? Like, where, where does it say the X amount of mass of water that the universe started with? Is, is that let, me ask, Bible let me ask you a better question. How, excuse me, I need to get a drink. What do you think the likelihood of going to the big biblical text, starting with water, taking the known mass, taking the known um, decay curve for magnetism in planetary bodies, and putting it together and accurately predicting something would be very low, not quite as low as predicting the age of the earth in Hinduism, but maybe a quarter of that. So can you, can you show me anywhere at all that you can uh, demonstrate reasonable assumption of deep time? I don't know what that has to do with the previous question. So uh, do people make predictions with equally as much probability as that all the time? Yes. Hindus predicted the age of the earth, 4.3 billion within 5% accuracy. That's far better than what you just predicted about the range of magnetic fields because it started in water, which makes no sense at all. Like you need to actually explain how you get from. Well, I'm I'm not a physicist, so I'll just have to refer you to Russell Humphrey, but but I'm not asking asking for a specific mathematical equation here. I don't need the specific mathematical equation. What I need is a logic tree that shows from this fact, we can get to this fact by using this fact. Like evolution is very easy. Evolution is change in uh, gradual change over time. Like that's pretty easy. And so if gradual change over time happens and evolution is true, then you'll see transitions from a previous form to a new form. So like we'll see a double hinted jaw joint come from a single hinted jaw joint or vice versa, or we'll see- I'm going to say you have not actually seen that. I'm, I'm going to say what you've actually done is dug up no, fossils not, in a variety saying, of locations and inferred that. Saying, not saying I've seen it. The point of this is to explain clearly how you get from hypothesis to expected result. That's that's all I'm. That's what I'm trying to under, to understand here is how you uh, or, or Robert Humphreys gets from hypothesis, young Earth creationism, to expected result, magnetic field of Saturn. That's the part I'm missing. So in evolution, it's easy to understand that you can cognitively imagine in your head, if evolution is true. Gradual change happens. Gradual change goes from one form to another. And so the fact that there's a double hinted jaw joint here and a single hinted jaw joint here makes perfect sense because there's gradual change. It's very, very easy to understand how the argument works in a structure. Yours makes no sense. You're just saying creationism, therefore magnetic field. But I need, I need, I need the middle part there of how you get from creationism to gravitational field. I think I explained it really well. You start with the mass. You start with the given mass. What, 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 do, you, what do you mean? So, so like we, we look at the mass of Saturn using actual real science, not creation of science. And then we start with that, which has nothing to do with the Bible. And then what? So you take the known mass of Saturn by gotcha. observation and gravitational calculation. Yep. Take the known mass of Saturn. Yep. You assume it started out as a body of water. What does what, what do you mean? So literally a hundred percent of Saturn was that mass I, and water? I, I think Russell Humphreys would have to clarify that point, but I did get that impression, yes. Okay, so it's made of water, just an entire body of water. Yes, very di- yeah, obviously very different than the um, secular next, paradigm. What's next in the logic tree? But with that body of water, the assumption is is that is that if if you want Okay, so there's a couple couple kind of fine points for the actual science itself. In hydrogen, in water, if the um, if the hydrogen bonds are aligned perfectly, the way I was describing earlier, there's no magnetic field. But all water has a very weak magnetic field because all water is moving. Its temperature is above zero uh, Kelvin. 
blah, blah, blah. So the atoms are moving so the bonds can't be perfectly aligned anymore. But point is, on the one hand, perfectly aligned means no magnetic field, but all existing water in, in the form of water has a very weak magnetic field. So what you do is you take everything perfectly aligned and suddenly flip the poles on it or, or flip the alignment on it and you induce a magnetic field. This is under, this is well understood science. There's nothing. Well, the part, part of this here is like, that. so the water planet Saturn, it, how does it get a, ma a magnetic field is from what generates the magnetic field in Saturn? Cause it's not the water. alignment of the hydrogen bonds. I've, I've said that several times. Okay. So, so there's water and now all of the water is gone. I didn't say that. Where did where did you get that from? You're saying water Saturn has water. What do you mean by gone? Yeah, there's no more water on Saturn. It's not if it was a planet of water at one point, and now there's no liquid water. Oh, I'm not I'm not implying it's covered in water or anything else. What I'm implying is is that the body that is Saturn started out as water with perfectly aligned hydrogen bonds. Now, what happened to the water, I don't know, but I did not claim that it all just went away. That's that's not even the point anyway. The point is, is that when you go through this physics exercise, you literally induce a field strength of a known magnitude that's based on the volume. So it's it's volume dependent. Okay, but because it's volume dependent, you can calculate a more or less an exact magnitude. That magnetic you fields get. are generated by metal, metal, uh, metal, big, uh, big things of iron, liquid iron rubbing together generates magnetic fields, not water. Um, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go back and look in some actual scientific literature because water does have a very weak magnetic. Field. No, 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 the magnetic field in Saturn is caused by the iron the metal like Saturn's magnetic field is generated by the fluid motions of the electric conducting portions of the interior that measures this region is in which hydrogen exists is a fluid metallic state around a cent central rocky core comprised okay. of the inner half. Uh, of the I'm not, I'm not contesting that point because it's not relevant. Okay. You could not, you could not use that information. What you just said, you could not use the current composition of Saturn and, and that's kind of the whole point here. You cannot use the current composition of Saturn, back drive it to 4.5 billion years, roughly, whenever Saturn supposedly formed, and then calculate the current magnetic strength. Well, I never and said that's, you could. that's the whole point, is they tried that, and it did not work. I never it's, said you could. So, so I'm asking, how did he go from it's made of water to now it's made of metal, and the water created a magnetic field, which can then be, I don't know, patterned out in some kind of a pattern that leads to its current metallic electromagnetic field which has nothing to do with water and so it seems like let's say let's say if i made a prediction that mm, uh saturn has an electromagnetic field of x and i'm right but i said it's also made of cheese that's wrong well then the, then the prediction is wrong it, it is a wrong prediction yeah. so if so if his prediction is somehow it started as water and then converted to something that said nothing what not at all water Okay. His prediction was wrong, just like if I said Saturn was made of cheese. No, because the diff the other key difference that I did not mention here is that in, in the YEC paradigm, we have a miracle worker. And and <laughs> so pay real close attention because this is an important part of it. Magic, Personally, so magic. for me, whenever I have these discussions, I am not going to invoke a miracle unless the Bible actually gives warrant to do so. And the Bible specifically says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the heaven and the earth. And then it goes on to say day one, day two, day three, day four, day four, all the stars, which includes the planetary bodies are created on day four, just three days after the earth. Okay. So the, so, the, so was this, was this something Robert, Robert said, like, so Saturn starts as water, uh, magic, it turns into metal and creates an electromagnetic force. And he's predicting the relationship between the initial water starting condition plus the magic to be able to conclude that it has this exact magnetic field? Well, so, no, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. The thing about iron is virtually all iron has a magnetic field as well too, right? Sure. But what's the magnetic field strength of a chunk of iron floating in space at three degrees Kelvin? Uh, negligible, nothing. As long it, as it's exactly. So where did Saturn get any of its iron from? 
gravity causing it to like be crushed. So the gravity causes it to be crushed together into a liquid because it's hot and melts. Now, see, here's where you're going to need a miracle, but you don't have one because you have no miracle worker. Because planets, I understand that the paradigm is that there was this uh, debris disk floating around the sun, and then you get some coalescence, right? That's how planets form, yeah. Right? You yeah. get some coalescence. Eventually, things start kind of coming together to form what they call planetesimals, pre-planetary bodies, right? Yeah, gravity, gravity's a thing, yes. Has anybody ever seen anything like that happen in space? Yes, we literally watch it all the time through telescopes. Where at? Uh, the Kuiper Belt. We can see things get merged together all the time from those. Uh, uh, we can watch... I'm going to say no, because I've, I've read enough ast astronomy to know that um, you don't actually see most of what you, what you try to look at out there. Um, it's a very, very difficult to look at planets. We see things animals. smash together, yes. We, we see lots of things smash together. We see uh, things smash I, I, on the moon together, right? We, I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call major bluff on that because if we did see such a thing, we would certainly have live videos of it actually They're called happening. meteorites. Yes, we do. Do they form planetesimals when they smash together? They add mass, yes. So they, things hit other things, and then the mass is added, and then other. And they also continue. take away mass. What? So, so, so you think that every collision must subtract mass? I didn't say that. Are you so saying every things... collision builds mass? Yes. No. I mean, I think literally they have to necessarily. Like, no. Literally every collision is collisions really because... ricochet. Some collisions ricochet. Some collisions hit ricochet and um, basically eject more mass than what the initial impacting body had. Right, but they still add mass to one or the other because it's going to get ejected and then Sometimes fall back just in. Fly right? apart. And then, and then fall back together eventually because gravity is a thing. Uh, that's another major problem with the evolutionary paradigm. Well, not okay. only so, so, so let's say, let's say collisions at a low enough speed will clearly combine right like if we drop two objects they fall together that's the, that's one of the problems is the low enough what? speed where like, do where do heavy elements come from El heavy, elements above above he um supernovas do, what does this I, have to do with the supernovas what does this have to do with the topic well you, you keep talking like you understand planetary formation but you got to get the dirt from somewhere right the dirt the dirt, the rocks, heavy whatever. elements. You mentioned heavy elements. Heavy, heavy elements are a result of supernovas in stars, right? Which I don't know what that has to do with anything we were just talking about. But my argument was is that rocks hit, and if they hit at a low enough speed, they connect and grow. Hypothetically, that bigger. can happen. I'm, I'm not saying it can't. That's not the point. And there's lots of them all over the place like the Kuiper belt, a bunch of rocks of all kinds of sizes. And they tend to be getting bigger because they combine. So I see your hands waving. Yes. Um, I think that's kind of what you're doing here is giving a hand wavy. Yeah. Cause it's, it's so insanely just basic and easy to understand that. Yes. Rocks hit and combine. And this is a thing. And we I, see it in space. I'm not arguing that they don't. What okay. I'm saying is, is well, isn't, that, isn't that, I, I thought that's what, what you were arguing. Cause you're saying you're that not seeing when you talked about the Kuiper belt, what you're not seeing is actual planetary bodies form. I'm not, you might see, a, any... you might see a couple random collisions. I kind of doubt that too, though, because uh, deep space is kind of dark and I seriously doubt that you're seeing very much um, outside of our solar system. Um, I'm not following you... your logic here. So, so rocks combine and they get bigger and you're saying, they're just not going to get to the size of planetoids or something like, well, I think you have to back it up bigger, a little bit. You have to, you have to have a mechanism to have rocks moving slow enough so that they don't destroy each other when they do collide. Like in the Kyber belt, they're all moving relatively the same speed. Um, but why are they moving at that speed? That's kind of the point. I'm, this is kind of like a root cause analysis where you where you start at point A and go back wait, and wait, say, wait, wait, why wait. did the that first, happen? The, why did that first happen? Said, the first problem is you have to get them at the right speed. Well, they are at the right speed. At the Kyber Belt, they are at the How right speed. How did they get that way, though? What, what is it? That, My what does point that matter is, to your first the evolutionary injection? paradigm can't explain how they got to that speed. Gravity. Gravity is how they did that. No. It's very easy to explain that's that. I don't how, understand the problem. That's not how gravity works. It, it, so, me, so large, massive objects 
exert force on other objects, and if they're traveling next to it, it gets pulled together, well, slowing you, it you down. You just took a giant leap forward past a whole bunch of necessary steps, is my point. What? What? Okay. Gra gravity slows... What, what steps am I skipping when I say gravity so, slows stuff down? You are me for a second, and let me kind of step you through it as quick as I can, then I'll let you respond. Okay. Star explodes. Heavy elements come from that, right? Sure. Okay. How fast are the projectiles moving from an exploding star? All different speeds. Like, by and large, the vast majority of the mass is moving at a very, very high speed, well above what any planet in our solar system is currently moving. Sure. Like, orders of magnitude. So, sure. very first star explodes, The what slows any of the projectiles down? Other stars. Uh, T-Rock, before gonna... you continue, uh, maybe just another minute of this topic, and then why don't we shift to, because I know there are just so many good points, um, you know, that could be discussed, and you guys may have been discussing this one for a while, but that's also uh, kind of what the audience is pointing out. So okay, so you guys no, fair enough. maybe another minute of this, and then, uh, you know, redirect to another topic. Fair enough. I'll wrap up my, my explanation real quick. You got to start exploding. You got debris flying through space. Yes. The stars are not going to slow it down the way you think it is. <laughs> Either they're going to impact the star, get sucked in by the gravity, and get burned up and not become a planet, or... Wait, wait, um, that, that, that's in most cases, down. they're going to that, miss the star down. completely. Or if they can be influenced by the star's gravity, chances are they're moving so fast and they're not close enough anyway that it's basically going to going to change their their uh, the projected path that they're on. But it's not actually going to capture anything because if it does get close enough to capture, it's going to be whizzing around that star super super fast, and the the actual linear velocity is not going to be decreased significantly at all. So I, I think well, I we mean, can the literally see this. Tells you that that's like we can literally not... see supernovas happen in space and mm -hmm. we can see that when the supernova happens, the debris is curved by a galaxy, other stars yeah, nearby. I, I said the that. gravity pulls it into the other galaxy. Like it's, it's not going past the vast majority of it's going into the other galaxy, into a nice little ring formation. So, on the edge so of are it. you telling us that you've actually seen some of this debris captured in the yes. orbit of a star we see that's lots of examples of that literally from hubble and the yeah. new one probably <laughs> i think i think not i think you're gonna have to actually bring that evidence that you saw debris captured in the orbital path of a star oh, okay. of a star not a galaxy a star Wait, galaxies are just a bunch of stars what 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 why is that a problem because planets form around stars not galaxies uh, what so so Star explodes, sends matter in all directions, and that matter has to be slowed down by something. There's other matter in the form of other stars and other rocks, planets, white dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes, and they pull on that stuff to slow it down. And it gets pulled into the galaxy, which is just a collection of a whole bunch of that stuff. And it slows it down enough so that it gets trapped in the galaxy. I'm not sure what the problem is here. Me saying it's a star rather than a bunch of stars isn't a difference. Uh, you keep saying slowing down, but I'm trying to explain to you that it's not slowing down the way you think it is. As a matter what? of fact, a, a large star, if, if some piece of debris is flying by very fast, what that star is actually going to do is speed it up. And um, it's... it's um, it, all you're going to do is is uh, change what, change what, the direction, oh and you're not going to meaningfully uh, decelerate oh the actual linear velocity of the star. In order for gravitational acceleration to work, it has to go through a very precise angle through the gravitational field. It's a, of all of the different degrees it could go through. It's a, it's incredibly small percentage will actually get sped up. The vast majority can get slowed down in any direction, like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of it all going to get slowed down. Okay, well, the vast majority is going to miss the stars completely because in the early universe, there weren't that many stars to begin with. <clears throat> so anyway, let's let's move on. Let's let's go look at some other ideas where you think you can see deep time, specifically here on Earth. Well, um, do you have any other predictions? That we in the about? geological column where evolution takes place. So can you point out to me where you can verify deep time happens in the, in the uh, supposed geologic column? Well, I've got a picture for you. Uh, stars exploding in dusty galaxies and 
we can see them. There you go. And so we, we can actually see the picture of the dust from a supernova and it's being curved for some reason. Explosions don't curve, which must mean I'm right, doesn't it? No, because you missed one of the key ingredients. I, I told you it quite plainly that a star can can change the the uh, the uh, trajectory path. It, that's that's a no brainer. Obviously, so things fly by the Earth, and that happens all the time. The Earth's no nowhere near the mass of the star. That's not the only mechanism you need. You need more than just change the the trajectory. If it can curve it like forty five degrees and still be trapped inside the rotation of the galaxy that's um, stopping it that is so much that it's going to fall back in on itself that is a stopping no it's not everything's flying apart the moon is literally separating itself from the earth and the earth is separating itself and drifting apart so they don't drift together they drift apart we've got a pretty strong mag uh, gravitational pull between the earth and the sun and we're not getting closer to it actually i think we are but it's a different topic. It's irrelevant. Okay, so um, geologic column. Where do you see deep time in the geologic column that alludes to the idea that the fossil transitions that you mentioned are actually the result of a lot of time? Where do I see deep time in the geological column? The amount of time it takes for sedimentary layers to form? Like, um, just, And there's lots of sedimentary layers, so we just count them like tree rings? Really? So if you see sandstone, for example, let's say it's... 30 meters thick. What's the deposition rate? I have no idea. Okay. Let's say it's 30 meters thick and it's deemed to be, I don't know, 100,000 years old. What's the deposition rate? What is, what is it? Well, I mean, don't, you don't have to give me a number, but you know, it could be calculated hypothetically, right? Sure. Because what you're saying is you're getting a very slow, continuous deposition of the exact same material over hundreds of thousands of years. I'm not sure how that works either, because that's not anything anybody Wait, what, has ever observed in real time what, or could observe. What what do you what are you saying doesn't make sense there? Um well I'm I'm just pointing out it does not make sense that you would have, let's say, you know, five thousand square miles of sandstone and it's all the same material and it just kept depositing the same sandstone year after year after year for a hundred thousand years and never got anything else um mixed in with it. right that, that, that wouldn't make any sense we literally know that there are gravitation or like volcanic right. eruptions that leave sedimentary layers that we can literally see here's here's where a difference happened so where's the erosion what erosion exactly where's, where's erosion, the erosion is a product of water so water hits something and erodes something so if there's no water there's gonna be no erosion but with slow and gradual deposition certainly you have weather going on on the planet that is going to erode while the deposition is happening no sure Okay, what is that? So, like it's not going to erode an entire layer of an entire continent. I didn't, that's not what I'm getting at. I didn't say sure that, but at. let's take a cross section of part of the geologic column where you've got, you know, these 30 meters of, which is really, really thin layer um, compared to a lot of strata. But anyway, 30 meters, you've got a cross section of it, pure sandstone. If it was really laid down very gradualistically over a hundred thousand years, why isn't there any erosion in the midst of that cross section? Why isn't there know. any apparent erosion? Well, er erosion in the midst of that is stuff that won't be there. So it's erosion is cutting stuff away. And so if there's like uh -huh. a layer of sand and you cut away a layer of sand, then it's not there anymore. And a different layer of sand will go on top of it. And you won't see the layer of sand that is missing because it's not there. Okay, that's great. But now you're implying that 5,000 square miles and erosion always just made a perfect shear off the top, like a, like a, like a planer on a board or something. I don't, I don't know what you're arguing. I have no idea what, what you're arguing. You right just now. said that the lay. Yes. Yeah, the... so, so if, if there's erosion, that means something's gone. It's taken away. So why don't yeah. we see something not there? Cause it's not there. And, and to get no apparent erosion, what erosion actually does is cuts crevices and channels and things. Right. It and does not those. just shear off the top and leave no evidence that erosion. Right. Happens. Like when a river, when a river goes through something, it erodes exactly. in a big line. And we see that. That's that's what the Grand Canyon is. Why do you have five thousand square miles anywhere in the world of pure Because there was no river there. With no rivers in it. Because the Grand the Canyon does. Yes, the Grand Canyon has a big Yes. Slice carved through it from water rivers erosion. Rivers don't cover the majority of the planet, so most of the planet won't be covered in rivers. Um, so 
in like, 100,000 like, years. Not most, that I'm asking like, so just, for just a river like, to be take formed, the Grand Canyon. if any rainfall at all had happened, there should be some sort of channeling erosion. However thin it might be, you should distinctly see no. these, these crevices where erosion has cut. However shallow they might be, you should see a little bit of, of water erosion from, from even minimal rainfall and then more layered on top of that. And then that should follow the, the previous curve. And then maybe erosion in a different no. place dips into what? it slightly. And redeposit erosion, erosion happens over a long period of time, not a day of rainfall. A day of rainfall isn't going to cause erosion on geological time scales of sandstone that are 30 meters deep. I have no idea what you're even saying. Like, in order to cause erosion that is noticeable, it would take months of constant rainfall going in the same direction in the same place, which is a river. And we do see that at rivers where there aren't rivers, we won't see that because there isn't enough water in that one location to erode the matter in that location and leave a mark. So one of my one of my favorite examples of this is uh, a map I brought up in, in one of my previous debates of the U.S. It's an elevation map is all it really is. But it shows that like the western half of the U.S. is, is on average at a significantly higher elevation than the eastern half of the U.S. Now, what's interesting to me about that um, is that you're kind of just throwing erosion out there and saying, oh, erosion removes stuff. Well, obviously it does. But there's a specific geometry you get from um annual rainfall erosion and there's a specific geometry you get from trade winds uh, erosion too um, neither of those are apparent in in many 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 meters of of uh, sandstone deposits across the world but because um, they in this, so, well, I don't, in I this u.s the elevation map that i'm i'm talking about you've got places at ground level thousands of feet above sea level where there is supposedly you know, di there, there are dinosaur fossils found, but they're found at ground level and they're a couple thousand feet above sea level. Now, what's the problem is if they're dinosaurs at all, they're at least 65 million Wait, years so, old, so, right? So is your argument that you must see erosion in every rock layer? Or it's I'm fake. saying, well, there is actually, yes, because there's a very specific reason for that too. And it has to do with lunar recession. What? Yeah. What, why would you need to see erosion in literally every rock layer? Because the further you dial back the clock, the closer the moon is to the Earth, and the heavier the gravitational pull, the higher the tides, the stronger the uh, the um, the trade winds, the strong everything just increases in magnitude as the moon approaches the Earth. All you're doing is accelerating erosion going backwards in time. So 100 million years ago, the moon was way way too close. Um, and by way, way too close. I mean, what does even that have 10%. to do with seeing geological erosion in sandstone? Huh? What does what the moon's distance have anything to do with seeing geological erosion in every layer of sandstone in the world? I don't, I'm not following your logic here. I just told you that you've heard of the inverse square law, I'm sure. Like the distance, the rate the moon is receding. What does this have to do with like? We, that's not that's not the rate the moon is receding. It's the inverse square law. They're two different things. Two, the inverse. I'm trying to understand the, which has to do with what in the argument. You're saying so, the moon is receding, so and I'm trying to tell you, but you're going to have to listen for a second because the moon, if it's ten percent closer, take the inverse square of z of um, of zero point nine, and you can calculate what the actual percentage increase in gravity is. 10% is too much. So the, Earth, the, the moon is currently some 240,000 miles away from the Earth. So 10% would be 24,000 miles. And so 216,000 miles from the Earth, it's still way out there. But at that 10% uh, decrease in distance, um, you, you literally get some 23% increase in the gravitational pull, which seriously accelerates the, um, the erosion rates on Earth because of what the moon does to the tides. On the rivers, not on everywhere. No, everywhere. The moon literally lifts dry ground. Sorry, it does. The moon literally what? lifts dry grounds. It moves water. It moves the ocean. The moon pretty much stirs everything. Well, the, the moon can bend the planet a bit. It doesn't okay. like literally lift a layer to cause erosion of that layer. It's not like we're going to select the top layer and move this one layer a bit because the moon. Okay, you know? but think about what you just said. Yeah, moon bends planet, yes. Okay, so 65 million years 
times 12 lunar cycles for any one point on the planet, you're literally flexing the ground up and down yeah, by several feet, actually, in some yes. places, depending on how, how rigid the terrain is. But it right. can literally flex the ground up and down 65 yes. times 12 million times. And you're saying we shouldn't see any signs of it's it should all the be whole perfectly planet. homogenous all the time. The, the layers form on the top. So if it's bent up and then bends down and the layer forms and then if it, it bends up, up and bends down the layer forms, they're going to look the same. And it bends down and it rains even a few inches a year. What, what, what is the rain? Rain wouldn't make a difference here. I'm not, I, there's no, uh, yeah. What, what, rain makes a big difference to the That's, rivers where the erosion takes place. Rain does not only happen where there are rivers. In order rain to make causes erosion where what, there what are is, not what rivers. What does sedimentary layer mean? Sedimentary. What does that mean? So let's switch gears again. What does since... a sedimentary layer... Like, dirt isn't a sedimentary layer. If we look at the dirt on our lawns, is that going to form a sandstone layer? Are we going to see the little worm trails in my yard out front in the sandstone layer? Is that going to be there? Um, to answer your first question, does dirt form sandstone? Obviously not. You have to have water, like a global flood or a uh, flood. Okay, ask, ask the second question. The dirt we see, there's water and dirt in my front yard. Is that okay. going to form a layer that we're going to see in the geological time scale? The dirt in my um, front yard. Are we going to see the worms and the rain erosion in my front yard in these in these in these like geological time scales in the, in well the, if you layers. have millions of years that brings up a whole other point where's all the bio perturbation of the soil where's all the paleo soil at how does the layer form like what what, what causes it to remain there and turn into a giant rock because there's clearly a difference between dirt and rock right they're not the same thing what's the difference between dirt and rock organic how does soil the dirt is... become rock uh, organic soil is most commonly from plants breaking down inorganic um, um, particles like dust and clay and stuff like that. So plants break that down, turn it into organic soil. So you get a difference in the soil, but ultimately it comes from inorganic material. So like plants have the ability to leach minerals out of solid concrete or rocks or just about anything on the ground. Plants have the ability to leach that material out so you can get organic soils out of that but where did the sandstone come from sandstone That's came from water question. transportation so, so like if when we see a layer if we go to go to the grand canyon we see a layer how much of the dirt outside will it take to make one of those layers how many yards miles of dirt outside will it take to make one of those layers none dirt doesn't make that type of layer mm whatever material you want like so so you're saying there's there's like a ground layer right and that ground layer is going to have to accumulate and then it gets compressed and dried and forced into a giant rock right it's, no. it's one solid rock it's not like it's dirt anymore it's not like it's sand anymore it's a rock no most most of the sand in the world comes from eroding solid rock from what? specifically right. oh God. i'm asking uh, about basement. the layers the not there's not sand the layers in the grand canyon are not made of sand they are made of rock right okay but they you, weren't you, rock you, initially when they were on the top they weren't rock it wasn't a rock it wasn't one solid rock when the sedimentary layer formed was it it was sediment um i, I did uh, you, you've got this, this very foggy starting point. What are you starting with? What? The the I, layers that you see in the Grand Canyon are quite obviously okay, every the, one the of them. The process to turn sediment into solid rock is going to eliminate any of the minor deviations you're going to see from worms or tiny little amounts of rain creating like a millimeter of uh, like but erosion. It, but it sounds like it's what you're imagining. Gone. It sounds like what you're imagining is a solid pile of loose rock or a solid pile of loose sediment that hardens over time. Right? What? So the process to make it from soil, from topsoil to a sedimentary rock, yeah, it's going to harden it. It's going to crush it. It's going to solidify it into a giant rock when it wasn't a giant rock. It was sand. What? Sand can turn into a sedimentary layer. Ash can turn into a sedimentary layer. It didn't start as a giant rock. The ash... From the volcano wasn't a solid rock. Now it is a solid rock. So it went from a non-solid state to a solid state. Okay. But 
the sandstone it's a process. itself. It's, it's hard. It's hard to do that. Like compressing a bunch of ash to a solid rock is hard, right? It takes a lot of energy to do that. It takes a lot of pressure, probably. Yes, and that pressure is going to alleviate, eliminate all the little tiny deviations. Like if a worm crawled through it, you're not going to see that, right? No. If the rain uh, fell I mean, and created that's, like a little... That's obviously bogus because we've got what? lots of uh, soft-bodied fossils uh, or, or fossil remnants that, that come out of some of these layers. Does, does that mean um, we're going to see literally every one of them? Do you think we see every one of them? These layers that you're talking about, they're no, every worm, every every little worm trail. Do we see every little worm trail or is it like very rare that we see those? It's rare because the process that you described did not happen. What? So okay, so the process is lots of pressure, right? There's lots of pressure that crushes these no, layers. The process you said was very slow deposition. That's not a lot of pressure. That's the start. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't so go from very slow deposition to solid rock. Thousands or millions of oh years. My God. This is not hard. This is not hard. The process to turn like topsoil into a sedimentary layer takes lots of pressure, lots of time, and it crushes any small deviations. You're not going to see little small deviations except in rare, rare cases where we're very, very lucky. It's, what's, it's what's ridiculous hard about it to expect. You're jumping right your, past your argument was so mechanisms. dumb. You said that every single inch of every single place of the planet layers would see erosion which is stupid it's like I did saying not we're say, going to see that's not exactly what i said what okay erosion well, in general is almost it's all but absent from a a hundreds of millions of years timeline it's it's all but absent there's like very little evidence of erosion over long periods of time, even very slow erosion there's very little except evidence. for like rivers and the grand canyon where there's lots of evidence of it so well, evidence of erosion very rapid erosion is a yes. weak force. It takes lots of energy to make any significant change, like a worm. It, erosion makes less impact on the dirt on the ground than a worm does. We don't see worm trails because the process to create the layers crushes any of that kind of tiny detail that we would see there, except in extremely rare cases. So the fact that we don't see this extremely tiny detail in the vast majority of places makes perfect sense. Your argument is dumb. No, you, you kind of missed the point where you started out talking about this very slow deposition rate. So Which here had you, literally that here that's, yes, that's how they start. So here you've got this worm in the ground. He's dead. Right. Very slow deposition over the top of him. He doesn't have any pressure on him. There's no pressure there. Mm -hmm. He's got literally in your paradigm tens of thousands of years with very minimal pressure and plenty of time to fossilize. And so you you're kind of bypassing that step and you're just you went from, oh, we get this very slow deposition to all of a sudden we've got tons and tons of pressure from from thousands of feet of rock or however you, you want to describe it. But you, you're literally jumping off of one onto a completely literally different Literally none of that is an objection to my argument. Them. Literally none of that is an objection to my argument. So if a worm dies, the bacteria in it's going to decay it, and so none of it's going to be left in there anyway. Yeah, that's a great point. It takes a very special process to make a fossil, doesn't it? Yes, which is why it's so rare, and the process rapid in order to deposition. Make it, sure, sure, rapid deposition. Yes, which is the opposite of what you described as very slow, gradual. Over I'm talking tens about of the layers years. in geology, not rapid deposition. The layers in geology isn't rapid deposition. Those form over hundreds of thousands of years. That's not rapid. That's the opposite. How of did rapid. you get Literally, the fossil? everything you said is dumb. What? How did you I'm get not talking the fossil? about fossils. I'm not talking about fossils. I'm talking about the geological layers, the layers in the Grand Canyon. Each every layer. Those are not fossils. Those are not like a fast deposition of things in one location that's a bunch of time building top ground soil and turn it into a giant solid rock at the bottom it's not so, so, the same as a fossil so far you said that organisms in the ground don't fossilize very often they take a special process to fossilize right. that's true very slow you've also said very slow and gradual deposition for geological scales which have nothing to do with fossils okay but the fossils have to exist inside of a finite period of time. What? 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 That's literally nothing to do with anything you I said. Literally, do not have a mechanism to create fossils except rapid deposition. And okay. rapid deposition is Go the back. opposite Go of back. what oh you're God. subscribing to build these layers. So the argument you started with was we don't see erosion in geological layers. That's what you said, right? Okay. Geological layers are not sudden deposition, right? Those are separate things. Geological layers are very slow 
takes a long time for them to form. Hundreds of thousands of years. For okay, so anything that deposits time, even anything that deposits quickly, is not a geological deposition. No, no, those would be too. But the things we're talking about is why don't we see erosion in every single geological pattern in the planet? Because they take a long time to form, and that long process of being frictioned together to form a solid rock is going to eliminate any small details, like if a worm happened to dig through it. That's going to be gone. Going to be gone, just magically gone. Because of pressure and the process it takes to make those layers in the first because place. Because you jumped from where he was there in the ground to all of a sudden, poof, a whole bunch of pressure and he's gone. There's a process in between there. There's a process in between when... No shit. And so what I'm trying to get you to see is that in your model, you practically have no weather patterns. It's very slow no. oh, erosional so rates will still create some erosional remnants uh, in solid rock or otherwise. I and so you're this. literally jumping from, this. I got a fossil and no, and no evidence left behind because all of a sudden it's just crushed under you know tens of millions of tons of rock i already explained this i've explained this i explained this like so like a four-year-old could understand it's not hard you you literally bypass the most important steps no so so that's kind of the crux of the whole evolution versus creation debate is you can't account for the deep time period because when you try and calculate uh, magnetic field strength of an external planet or you try and calculate what the gravitational pull of the moon is x number of years in the past or if you try and calculate erosional rates it, it almost doesn't there are so many different things if you try to apply deep time you run into so many conundrums you can't explain any of them you've provided no conundrums you've just said you don't understand how erosion little tiny things of erosion aren't seen on uh, layers that are hun take hundreds of thousands of years to form. Like, oh my God, erosion Ocean. that happened like once or twice a week. What didn't show up on a time scale of hundreds of thousands of years? Oh no. And how do you get any fossils? Because they are sudden. We, we do see erosion in places that are very sudden. No, that happens. So how about ocean salinity? The salt level of the ocean? Yeah. So what about like, it? so the salinity of the ocean increases over time sure if you try and wind the clock back at the known rates of of uh, that the salinity increases you run into this problem where you've um well because you're winding the clock back that means that the salinity decreases as you go back in time you can't go back in time 65 million years and get and, and arrive at any logical conclusion about why this because the rate the wasn't constant so today. problem solved give me one second please i'm gonna have to take a quick break okay um you know what that'll be a good time to wrap it up anyways because um looking at the clock we went about 10 minutes over anyways uh good discussion gentlemen ended up being entertaining anyways so appreciate it we do have some questions and um we can just move into closing statements and it'll be T-Rock who goes first. But since he's going to be uh, MIA for a minute here, I'll just go over some announcements in terms of uh, debates coming up. So uh, actually, firstly, thank you so much for all the super stickers, super chats that have come in showing uh, support and love. I do appreciate you guys are the life and blood of this channel. If you want to send in any last minute questions, you can do so right now. And uh, okay, a few debates coming up. Uh, Ken Hoven, Jay Bundy at the end of the month, evolution on trial. Um, this will be Kent's 300th debate. And um, Jay Bundy is an evolutionary biologist. This one should be a ton of fun. I'm looking forward to this one. Um, and as I reminded everybody earlier, we do have debates coming up in the next couple nights so this one second peter 220 uh this will be a soteriology related debate so charles jennings and Merritt. and at the end of the month another soteriology related debate this one specifically on james too so we got some more um specific debates on on some of these more controversial verses this will be charles jennings david preston both well 
educated individuals on this topic. We got Matt Slick coming back here in a week or so. Uh, he'll be debating Stanley Terry. Was Jesus fully God and fully man during his earthly ministry? And then in two days, we've got uh, we've actually got a few uh, Bible translation debates coming up for you in the next month. This one will be C.J. Cox and David Preston. Uh, first week or so of September. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the overall content. So just make sure to, uh, you know, check the event section. So it's either the first or second week of Question. September. We're going to, yeah, go ahead. TJ. Which position is David taking on that one? David is taking the uh, King James position. And then CJ is taking. Which one is the King James position? I'm not <laughs> theist. Oh, okay. He's taking a King James only position. So, so the... he's um, trustworthy. The... Right. Our modern English translation is dangerous. And he's saying it's trustworthy. Right. Right. So he's saying the King James CJ, version. Is, really... CJ is saying it's untrustworthy. Yeah. CJ would be considered more so. Uh, and CJ, if you're in the chat, sorry if I misrepresent your position. He's KJV preferred. So he does like the King James, but he's okay with the, the modern English translations. Where David would say, you know, the, the modern translations, the ESV, the NIV, the SUV, <laughs> kidding about the last one, um, are uh, untrustworthy, essentially. So a couple debates on that topic coming up. Uh, will Kinney versus Mark Gageton will be debating that same topic in September. This one, end of the month, CJ Cox, again, this will be conditional immortality and eternal conscious torment. t Jump, didn't you have a discussion recently with CJ Cox? Or was that yes. Nicholas Flip? Okay. Okay. Well, I, we did one on morality. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Who is a Turrentin fan? Is that a like Turrentin a fan? Yeah. He's um, he goes by I, I think his name on YouTube is is a pseudo a pseudo name, but he goes by Francis Turrentin on on YouTube and in his blog or Turrentin fan. So. Um, He'll be taking the eternal conscious torment position. CJ Cox will be taking, taking the uh, conditional immortality position. And looking forward to this one. So Robertson, Jenna, Steve Christie, they'll be debating. This will be in October, though. So this is a little ways away. They'll be debating uh, Protestant versus Catholic, the Marian dogmas debate. T-Jump, you've had a discussion with Robertson, Jenna, as well, I believe, right? <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> Who haven't you had a discussion with? Who is Steve Christie? What is his uh, background? He's a, uh, he's a Protestant, former Catholic. He has a YouTube channel called Born Again RN. And I believe he's, um, I think he's reformed, but he's had quite a few debates. He's debated uh, Trent Horn, who runs the Catholic Catholic um, Answers, I think, website and podcast. So he's, yeah, he's. He, it should be a good debate. It looks like T Rock is back now, just in time. So T Jump, T Rock, interesting discussion. Thank you both, gentlemen. Um, very lively at times. And I guess we're going to go into some, some closing statements. So hope everything's all right. T-Rock, we'll give you both five minutes. Uh, T-Rock, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay, I'm going into dark mode here just because I'm trying to kind of keep things quiet around here. It's it's starting to get kind of where everybody's going to bed. But um, anyway, so uh, basically what I'm trying to point out here for the audience sake is that there are things exclusive to the evolutionary paradigm. There are things exclusive to the young earth creation paradigm. They are non-overlapping. Those are the criteria that would set, create the litmus test for whether the ability to make predictions is actually meaningful. So um, in the video, the very first example brought out, of course, was a, um, was a moth and a flower. The infamous deal about the uh, elongated uh, probisc that can reach down to the bottom of a flower that was discovered first. Um, you need none of the tenants that are exclusive to evolution to predict such things. The claim is not that a creationist in particular predicted that. That's not the point. The point is, did you predict it with things that are exclusive to your paradigm? And so <clears throat> conversely, I was pointing out that, uh, you know, the magnetic field calculations that are done using standard physics equations um, very accurately predicted 
the uh, magnetic field strength of Saturn using both biblical information and known physics and the, the highly limiting factor of, of a 6,000 year timeline and made a very accurate prediction. Um, you cannot import any of the uh, tenets that are exclusive to evolution into that, those equations or that exercise and get the correct answer. Um, so <clears throat> Uh, that, that's basically the root of all of the, the evolutionary paradigm it has to do with, with time. Now we could talk about the fossils and, and I was trying to kind of demonstrate the same thing with the, uh, with the geologic column. Um, go take a cross section of a geologic column and then say that the layers are deposited very slowly one at a time. Um, that does not lend itself at all to fossilization of anything. Um, uh, t pretty much said that, you know, bacteria will eat up the, whatever, you know, organism is there. It's going to be eaten up and gone. Uh, obviously you have to have a rapid process to do that, but much of the geologic column is actually, we talk about, uh, overlapping, uh, or we talk about polystrate fossils. Of course, evolutionists hate that word. They don't like it. It's not a, uh, an evolutionary term. They call it a, 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 a creationist term. I think it's a really solid argument to show that the layers are not depositing slowly, but I think there's an even stronger argument than that. And that is, um, overlapping fossils that continuously overlap one here, one here, one here, and they, they share space between these layers that supposedly, uh, deposited at a very slow rate, but yet the fossils are, are uh, occupy the entire strata from top to bottom and have a high degree of overlap from top to bottom. Um, nothing about deep time, the exclusive piece of the evolutionary paradigm suggests that that's a reasonable thing to get out of many millions of years worth of passing. So um, <clears throat> again, that, that, uh, that whole, that whole video on, on trying to make predictions did not do any of the thing exercises that demonstrate the exclusivity of evolution and its paradigm to be able to generate those predictions. So on the creation side, um, I did indeed provide some pretty good um, rationale for how it is that we have homologies in the first place as a design criteria, it has to match the terrain. It has to match the food supply. Um, if you take the, um, the five digit extremities, for example, away from a whole lot of, of mammals, what are they going to navigate the planet with? If you randomly scramble them, I'm not sure exactly what the typical evolutionist is looking for in terms of what they think constitutes a design, but someone needs to explain to me what exactly do you expect to see for land-based locomotion if creation is true? What do you expect to see for a food supply if creation is true? And how would you apply that food supply to actually nourish living organisms? And so uh, I think evolution is completely without a rational explanation for how that's supposed to happen in a truly created world, which is part of the, uh, the a major tenet of refuting the creation position. So I'm gonna yield my time there. All right, thank you, T Rock. And now we're moving to T Jump for your concluding statement. Go ahead. I think you just said that creationism doesn't have an explanation for how a created thing would do all of that. I think I think he meant evol evolution. But anyway, uh, his his rebuttal is is just wrong. He's saying that in order for something to count as evidence in a novel prediction, it must not be able to be post hoc explained by a different hypothesis, which is just a misunderstanding of science. That's literally wrong. Um, no one cares if you can post hoc it. Everyone can post hoc it. You can say a leprechaun farted out the universe five seconds ago and gave you all of your memories. And so all of your memories of what happened in your past are perfectly explainable by a leprechaun farting out the universe five minutes ago. The fact that you can explain all of the data post hoc in any hypothesis doesn't mean it's not evidence for a different hypothesis. Whichever one can make the novel predictions about the future and get it right uh, is the one that gets the evidence. It doesn't matter if you can try to post hoc explain the actual evidence into your hypothesis. Everybody can do that. It's just it's not evidence. So I, I just don't just don't think he understands basic science there. I'll conclude there. All right, there we go. That concludes the concluding. 
statements from T Rock and T Jump Battle of the T's tonight, creation versus evolution. So, all right, let's get right into the audience questions. And again, if if you guys want, uh, you know, some input or add a few points to each question, that's fine. Uh, we'll just make sure whoever the question is for gets the last word. So, um, okay, here we go. Question for both. Question for both. Sean Mock. He asks, under your paradigm or model, how long does it take bones to mineralize into fossils? Uh, since T-Jump, I guess, just ended with his concluding statement. Why don't we start with you, uh, T-Rock? Just make sure to unmute yourself. You're good to go. <clears throat> okay. Um, no, uh, good question, but there, there is one little bit excessive generalization here. It's not... It, 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 there's not one answer to it is, is the, is the point here. So if you're an evolutionist, maybe they have a prescribed amount of time. I'm not sure, but um, in most cases they either have to switch gears and flip to a rapid process or they end up with some obvious conundrums about how fossils form. And I think the vast majority of the time they just flip gears and say, oh, a rapid process did that. Okay. How long does it take? Well, it's highly dependent on the mineral content in the water, uh, groundwater. Basically, what I'm assuming is that most fossilization happens from groundwater seepage um, at some fairly slow rate most of the time. Um, but so the, 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 two, the two main factors are what's the mineral content of the water? How fast is it flowing? And then, of course, how exposed is the um, the organism to things that degrade it rapidly? So um, the point is, is that in nature, yeah, it can take a little while, not tens of thousands of years. It can take probably years in some cases or decades even. But in a lab, you can do it in minutes or hours at the very least. Um, so so it's, it's a variable rate and it's dependent on multiple factors, but none of none of those factors fit a deep time paradigm directly. The minimum time for a fossil is 10,000 years. You can literally just Google it. How long does it take for something to be fossilized? The number is 10,000 years minimum. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for your responses there. Um, okay, Mark Reed. He, uh, $5 super chat. Thank you so much, Mark. And he's coming at you, T-Rock. So he's asking you, T-Rock, why did you not present any evidence for the creationist model or address anything in T-Jump's uh, intro? Thank you for the question, Mark Reed, but it seems like you missed a significant portion of the debate. Um, basically, I was actually addressing um, T-Jump's introduction before he even gave it because I was describing the differences between the two paradigms. And then after he gave it, I went back on my rebuttal and said, Hey, look at the moth, look at the flower. Um, what's the other, the other examples that he gave um, double headed jaw joint birds and fused fingers. I didn't get into every single one of them because they all share the same basic problem is that they don't use mutually exclusive pieces of that paradigm. And, and so um, I, I stated very plainly that in the moth example, you're talking about simple regulatory genes that can influence the length of the probisc and it happens very quickly. It does not take millions of years. Um, and that's a design characteristic specifically so that um, plant and animal life can inhabit the entirety of the planet and share a common food source. Okay, thank you very much, T. Rock. Anything you want to add, T-Jump? Uh, well, he did. I mean, he presented what counts as an argument. It's just a rejection of basic science that the problem under determination isn't a thing, apparently. So, I mean, he did try to address the points in the opening. All right. T-Rock, quick final word. Question was for you. Yeah, that's not a rejection of science. It's a rejection of, of an interpretation of science because nothing about a... a um, Nothing about a moth and a flower demonstrates that molecules became, or, or let me say it a different way, uh, microbes uh, eventually evolved over million, billions of years into people or deep time, either one. Nothing about those examples demonstrates either one of those tenets of, of evolution. All right. Thank you, T Rock, for the final word. And Mark Reed was coming at T Rock. And now Felix Rodriguez is coming at T Jump. 
So Felix asks, please ask T-Jump to show evidence for everything he just claimed on this show. Um, so he's he's saying that you, uh, I guess, put forth a, a majority or consensus fallacy. Go ahead, T-Jump, for your response. Well, there's, there's no such thing as a consensus fallacy. That doesn't exist. Uh, appeal to a majority is of people who aren't experts, and all the things I said were consensus of experts. Um, and appeal to authorities aren't fallacious if they're actual authorities. So none of that is, I mean, evidence for the claims. Oh, when I said he was rejecting science, I didn't mean about, uh, the moth. I meant about the problem of underdetermination saying that you need to make a prediction, um, specific or to only one hypothesis is a rejection of science. Science does not make that claim ever under any circumstance because it's impossible to do that. Like literally impossible to do that. Um, I don't know what other claims did I make? I don't know, not not much. Uh, rocks hit each other in space and gain mass. Like we can see that. It's uh, not hard. I don't know. You want you want pictures? I got pictures. All right. Thank you, T Jump. Anything you want to add, T Rock? Um, yeah, just that. Um, I think I think he kind of missed the real point behind whether something. The, the whole point behind presenting a a prediction is to show that only that paradigm can do that. And if you only make predictions that either one can, um, either either paradigm can make, that's what we call non-discriminating evidence. It doesn't tell you which one is the more reasonable position. It does nothing whatsoever to, to delineate which one is the more reasonable position. And it does nothing to demonstrate that, uh, obviously just re saying the same thing again it does nothing to demonstrate the exclusive tenets of your position of, of a particular position so i i mean i can make similar types of predictions with creationism and um if i'm not using tenets exclusive to creation i'm basically just saying hey the evidence is the evidence you, you can interpret it either way i'm not really sorting anything out at that point <laughs> Okay, thank you. And T jump, you get the last word. Question was for you if you want it. Yeah, like what he said there is that that's that's the rejection of science I'm talking about. So we know for a fact that's wrong. Like when we were transitioning from Newtonian gravity to Einsteinian gravity, uh, Einstein predicted the perihelion of Mercury. Newtonian gravity can post hoc explain that with a second planet. And they tried to do that, but it didn't matter because Einstein predicted the things before we knew them. Like he predicted the curvature of light around the sun accurately. The fact that you can explain that from the perspective of Newtonian gravity after it's discovered doesn't matter. Like no one cares. So his statement that it needs to be exclusive to your hypothesis is just wrong. Anybody can post hoc explain anything into their theory. It doesn't matter. It's just irrelevant. The fact that is is does one hypothesis make novel predictions we don't know yet and get them right before we know it, that's evidence. It doesn't matter if another hypothesis can come along and make up a new explanation to try to explain the data into their model. He just doesn't understand basic science. Like there is no requirement that it must be exclusive to your model. It's not a thing. All right. Next question, uh, T Jump. This one came from your chat. So there's a couple oh, cool. questions from your, your chat. This one's from John Rat. John, thanks for the question. So he says, question for both. How do you explain the necessary time frame for a layer of 300 to 400 meters of limestone? Um, anybody want to volunteer in terms of answering first? Question was for both. So it's up to you guys. I'm not sure I understand the question. How do you explain the necessary time frame? Like... I guess he's saying, uh, so uh, maybe from an old earth position and a young earth position, how do you explain the limestone? You know, which position is most compatible with, with the layers of limestone that we see? Uh, that's the best way I can interpret it. But uh, what do you think, T-Rock? Um, you know, I, th I think you kind of kind of said, I, I think what the question is getting at is if you're an evolutionist, explain how X number of, you know, millions of years or whatever, um, accounts for three to 400 meters. And if you're, if you're a creationist, how does a uh, 4,400 year timeline explain that exact same feature? I think that's what he's asking. Uh, so what say that again? How, how as an evolutionist would you, 
explain three to four hundred meters of limestone over however many years you believe it should take to oh to so form. yeah uh, calcium carbonate deposits from either evaporation or seashell animals so i'd say that it's just millions and millions of years of evaporation um leaving carbon deposits which then form into limestone in combination with seashells breaking down and forming limestone deposits. All right, T Rock, go ahead. Um, I, sorry, it's it's the same thing. He gave an explanation, but he didn't basically say how time affected that in any way, um, because the creationist explanation would be very similar. There are chemical processes that cause formation of limestone, and then there's also um, the the uh, pulverized uh, material that you get from seashells and stuff like that it's not a different explanation as far as where limestone comes from how did it get that thick in that short of time specifically um again it's about process as um john mckay likes to always point out it's not about time it's about a process it's just like the how long does it take for something to fossilize you have to assume a rate to calculate any amount of time but the rates are all variable. They're always variable, um, especially over deep time. But um, in, a, in a young earth creation perspective, um, chemical conditions would have been highly conducive to mass formation of, uh, uh, from, from specifically from chemical formation as opposed to biological formation. Um, but if you put the two together, because a lot of limestone actually does have a lot of fossils in it, um, so when you combine the two, you can get very rapid uh, deposition uh, because, again, it's about the process, not about some specific rate that you try to assign to it. Okay, well, that was a question for both. You both got an answer, so let's move on. Next one comes in from Jungle Jargon. This one is for uh, T-Jump. So I did a super chat asking T-Jump to explain the existence of matter and energy that cannot make or direct themselves. I don't understand the question. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. It's the first law of thermodynamics. So it's even like it wasn't created. So it Explain exists like necessarily. Yeah, I, I, maybe he's referring to that first law. Matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So how did it come about? I'm not sure. Uh, Jungle, if you wanted to elaborate in the chat, you could. Um, until then, we can move on if you would like to, gentlemen. Here's one from Stephen Tibbetts. Question for T-Jump. If geological layers form slowly and fossils need to get buried quickly, how did the fossils end up in the layers? Quick layers, question mark, slow burial, question mark. Um, both. Like there's multiple ways fossils can form. It's just very rare. So quick, quick coverings, like you mentioned, are one of the ways that most common ways for fossils to form they can also get like covered in tar pits or whatever and then those evaporate over time and dry out over time leaving the fossils there's lots of different ways but they're just very rare um so the, the geological layers can form around the fossils the fossils can form independently of the layers in many ways like if an animal falls into a tar pit it becomes a layer independent of the geological layer that forms around it All right, thank you. T-Rock, anything you'd like to add? I, I think what Stephen Tibbetts is trying to point out here is is the same thing I was trying to point out. It's it's kind of like um, you just have to randomly jump back and forth between mechanisms. Um, when you look at fossil formation, it, it obviously has to be fast. You can't just throw something on the ground, walk away, and hope it's fossilized in 10,000 years, the minimum that T-Jump gave earlier. Um, things just don't happen that way. So you have to bury them quickly. Um, but that was part of my point is most everything in the fossil record actually does get some kind of rapid burial assigned to it. Um, whether it was a, uh, uh, some kind of breach dam idea in the evolutionary paradigm, you know, um, uh, river bank overflowed, whatever it is, they, they're very quick to throw rapid processes at fossils because of the obvious reasons. Um, but even the layers that don't have fossils. So like, for instance, I want to say it's the, um, is it the Tapete sandstone in the Grand Canyon? It's mostly got um, footprints in it instead of hard body fossils. Um, when you look at those, the evolutionary paradigm says uh, slow and gradual processes in a dry environment, 
which makes no sense whatsoever when you actually look at the details because that same sandstone has um, mica in between the uh, the grains of sand that would not be there in a dry alien condition um, so it's quite obvious and, and this is something you can actually bench test uh, to see the difference between what water does with mica and what wind does with with the mica flakes um, in water they're preserved because there's enough lubricity between sand grains but in in an oleum condition they're not preserved they just basically get ground into nothing and so what's in the tapete sandstone a bunch of mica flakes that shouldn't be there if the evolutionary paradigm paradigm were true at all okay thank you t-rock t jump question was for you so if you want the last word you can certainly have it unless you want to move on uh no that's that's fine like yeah they they mostly form from rapid processes if they form from slow processes we see a lot more fossils they're pretty rare fossils are really really rare so yeah it's most likely that it's from a process that is rare like sudden encapsulation okay this one comes in from redefine living question four i am assuming you t jump so let's see there is not enough erosion sediment on the ocean floor to represent the measurable amount of erosion over deep time where did it go that's what limestone is 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 from erosion so yeah yeah there is what all right t-rock anything you'd like to add um yeah the, the question doesn't specify limestone it's it's just sediment in general but um it's the same basic problem that i was pointing out on land is is also apparent in the in the ocean um water currents in the ocean move very fast um what sediments are there um because they move the way they do basically the shoreline itself is receding all over the world and um, this is another one of those uh, kind of proxies for clocks you can you can use. It's quite obvious there's not enough time passed um, because there's not enough sediments to account for in the ocean floor. Um, okay, thank you, T-Rock. And uh, T-Jump, did you want a final word on that one? Nope. Okay, Jeremy Nolan has a question. And it's a question for T Jump. He says, You said evolution is change over time. How is that novel when everyone knows this? Like the sun comes up. Uh, so, if it's predicting something we don't expect to see, like obviously, if it predicts something we do expect, like the sun coming up, that wouldn't be evidence. So, predicting a new thing, like a transitional fossil between a lizard and a fish, like Tiktaalik something that creationists would not expect and think doesn't exist even after we found it, that would be novel when we discovered it. So it's predicting things that we haven't or don't expect that's evidence, not just things we already know. T-Rock? Yeah, I mean, and he, he's obviously kind of generalizing a little bit there, and, and I mean, I'm not, not arguing against that or anything but but the change over time thing i like to kind of relate this whole idea of change over time it's not it's absolutely not unique to evolution our bodies are what 80 plus percent water um anything made of 80 plus percent water is going to change over time whether you're talking about the individual or across multiple generations um chemistry blah 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 just about everything is going to change so literally just, everything just calling evolution change over time is is really it's falling short of what they're really trying to do and i mean in some sense it's a little bit dishonest because they have specific amounts of change that have to happen over specific periods of time final word t jump well yeah um that's why the predictions give a specific like they'll be found in this layer and it will be above this layer and below this layer so they're very very specific all right, here we go. Next question comes in from uh, T Jump. This is from your chat again. So this one comes in from Mr. Monster is a super chat. Oh, and thank so you, by the way, for covering my chat too. Appreciate it. No worries. No worries. So uh, there you go, Mr. Monster, $5 super chat for T Jump. And he is asking. So I guess this is, I'm assuming this is going to be a question for the both of you. So do you think humans evolved from lesser mammals? So I'll assume that's T jumps position or were created using magic out of dirt from the earth. So eh, we'll, we'll consider it a question for both. 
Um, since the last one, T-Jump started, why don't we start with you, T-Rock? Go ahead. So, <clears throat> obviously, I'm a creationist, but the whole magic idea to me is, is extremely disingenuous from the evolutionary camp. And the reason is, is because all forces in the universe are invisible. Every single force that can be described is only known by the effect it has, not by direct observation. So um, that, that idea that magic, in real terms, there is a personality behind it. You would, as an evolutionist, you would have no qualms whatsoever with somebody saying, what kind of personality do you have? The only way you can know that is by the way you act. I cannot see your personality. You have to behave a certain way. And so, um, you know, throwing out, I guess, somewhat derogatory terms like this to try and make a point, it's really, really disingenuous. There are forces in the world. Um, where did your personality come from? Why don't rocks have personalities if naturalism is true? Um, it's because they have no output. You have no way of seeing the effect of how they act because they can't. And so, you know, maybe you have a problem with the idea that a personality is outside of space and time. I think that's a lot easier to digest than eternal energy and matter. It, 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 it's, it's obviously people, uh, the, the philosophers and scientists alike realized hundreds of years ago that eternal energy, um, eternal worlds kind of thing doesn't make sense because um, you can't get to the point in time you're at now if the world was eternal. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. T-Rock, T-Jump, over to you. Uh, yeah, I think we evolved from animals, but magic is literally in the Bible. It's what the, the pharaohs, sorcerers used against Moses. Magic is literally a thing in the Bible. So it's not a straw man. It's, it's a thing that's in Christianity. Actually, I wouldn't normally, but, but I mean, you can respond after I get done. I wouldn't normally do this, but um, no, that is absolutely a straw man because the magic that the pharaohs committed is not what created the heavens and the earth, and it is expressly forbidden uh, by God in the Bible. But it exists. It's magic is okay, real. Okay, but who in the Bible demonstrated the ability to create a planet using that same magic? Well, it's not a straw man if it's a thing in Christianity. Like if we say a talking snake exists, that wouldn't be a straw man because it's actually in Christianity. We're not actually. It's that. not. <laughs> Can you show me in the Bible where there's a talking snake? A talking donkey? Do you prefer that one? Now that I can accept there's no talking <laughs> snake in the Bible. Okay, talking donkey. We'll go with that one. But the, the point is it's a thing in the Bible. It's not necessarily saying that particular thing was being used. Okay, but you're, you're... All right, well, uh, moving on. So logical, plausible, probable, and uh, we'll start winding it down here. He's gonna, uh, This one's a super chat from T-Jumps. Um, T-Jumps chat. So uh, John Maddox is putting T-Jump through university here, and uh, LPP has also got a bunch of super chats on my end too. So, uh, John, you're putting my kids through university. So, uh, super chat, this one specifically from T-Jumps and come to the after show. So, it looks like John's having an after show. And here it is again. After show will happen. Come share your thoughts. Who won? Who lost? Best comebacks and best zingers. Definitely uh, some, some fun, memorable moments in this debate. And let's wind it down with this last super chat. That comes in $50 super chat. Jay, thank you so much. Uh, Jay actually gave two $50 super chat. So God bless. I appreciate the support. And um, this one's for you, T-Jump, it looks like. Speaking of prediction, the fairy tale of evolution predicted that we would find millions of partially or mostly formed organs, claws, heads, feet, so on and so forth. Um, more of, I guess, a comment. But T-Jump, feel free to respond as you would like to. Uh, well, we did. We found, I don't know about the, not the soft tissue things, but the hard tissue things. We did find millions of those. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, Bubblegum can, says, can, do, do you mind, sorry, do you mind if I respond to that real quick? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Can you pop that back up? Yes. Um, there you go. Basically, this highlights one of the points I would have liked to have gotten to. Time just flies by so quick. But anyway, um, a, a part of part of the problem we should have we should have gotten into this is stasis. What this is alluding to is the extreme stasis in in the fossil record. Um, lobsters, crabs, uh, tree leaves, ants, spiders, snakes, turtles, 
everything is and fish everything is has such a high degree of stasis it's easily easy to recognize almost naming a specific currently existing species for for some of these um and so it kind of points to the um, reality that in the fossil record you you can't predict extinction and, be, and because you can't predict extinction you can't predict arrival either and so it, it's like always stasis and without the soft parts you, you only have um, a small percentage of your overall argument you need soft parts hard parts you need behavior and you need genetics you need all of them combined and the only thing you have is hard parts in stasis mostly <clears throat> okay thank you t-rock um T jump. I guess the question was originally for you technically. So if you want a final word there, you can have it. Yeah, you don't need any of that. You just need novel testable predictions. You can say, I have a hypothesis that evolution happened. If it did, we'd see this fossil in this layer, this fossil in this layer, and none in between or, or not in the other order. That's all you need. You don't need any, you don't need soft tissue. Bubblegum Gun really wants me to ask you, T jump. He put a super chat asking, Do you have a degree in philosophy like Daniel? No, no one should have a degree in philosophy like Daniel. Daniel is less qualified than anyone on Standing for Truth's channel. So props to STF, SFT. I'm guessing that's an insider of some kind between you and Bubblegum. Uh, Daniel Hikikichu, I had a debate with him yes, a few days ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. Um, also, it looks like a couple uh, just random super chats here. Cheers for the spam, uh, spanner. Nothing to say other than it's a great day. God bless. God bless you as well. Thank you so much. Mitchell says, uh, it's tea time with T-Rock, T-Jump, and SF Coffee. Yes, I've had lots of coffee today for sure. So are you guys tea drinkers or coffee drinkers or both? Both. Both. What about you, T-Rock? I'm heavy on the sweet southern tea. Sweet southern tea. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. That wraps it up. Thank you to my audience as well as T jumps audience. Uh, interesting discussion. Lots of fun. Thank you to the chat for all of your uh, questions, input, engagement, and also of course the supports with the support with the super sticker, super chats, as we like to do before we completely wrap it up. Also reminder, um, Sorry, John, almost forgot. Uh, don't miss the after show. It's going to be so uh, John's been doing um, after show marathon. So he had one last night and then the night before with the ERV debate between me and Luca. That one was a ton of fun. I think we went at it for six hours. I'm still exhausted from it. And then the night before that as well, which was um, uh, at the moment, I can't remember what debate that was, but he's been doing lots of after shows. So, uh, that being said, final words, final thoughts from the debaters. Why don't we start with, uh, T jump. Thanks Potato. for doing this. Uh, final words, final thoughts. You're good. Uh, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks T rock for joining your pleasant guy. Nice to talk with us. Uh, Donnie's nice for the most part. Occasionally. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me on. Um, thanks for the audience. Have a good night and good luck. All right. Thank you. T rock final words, final thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I enjoyed the debate. It gets a little technical and a little deep sometimes. I, I sometimes wish we could cover more ground. And I know probably the the um, the audience is really interested in specifically the evolutionary um, details of, you know, um, plant and animal biology, that sort of thing. Um, I wish we could cover some more of that sort of thing, but um, perhaps sometime in the future in another setting. But uh, thank you to the audience for tuning in. Um, really appreciate that. Um, Thank you, Donnie, as always, for, for putting this together. Um, I really do think you guys do a phenomenal job with the, some of your content. And uh, thank you, T-Jump, for joining the conversation. All right. Thank you. T-Jump, T-Rock, Battle of the T's. All right. Uh, to the audience, thanks again. Standing for Truth is out.